<laughs> the YWCA's mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I'm often asked about that. It, it's um, a, a pretty tall order for one organization to fulfill, but uh, but I see it as our. our our obligation and indeed our privilege to serve as a platform and a voice for those who have been historically or who are currently disempowered, disenfranchised, or marginalized in their experiences. We therefore owe it to this extraordinary community and those who live within it to engage in a courageous conversation of our own about racial inequity. Lately, I've been receiving a lot of feedback from colleagues and um, citizens of Monterey County that they're grateful that the YWCA says uh, what they feel that they themselves cannot. We don't shy away from tough issues. Um, we have informed opinions and express them as a way of engaging and challenging those around us to think critically and deeply about the issues of the day. And so let's just be very honest about racism. Let's not ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, and that social and racial inequities are especially not here in Monterey County, as we know, of course it is. Social movements never gain traction as a result of tiptoeing around delicate issues, ignoring them completely, or refusing to render opinions in so-called polite company. As civil rights attorney Francis Johnson so poignantly points out, race is a fiction, but racism is not. Race itself is without merits uh, as a biological uh, is without merit as a, a biological notion. It is, in fact, a, a social construct. Racism, as a theory, a practice, and discrimination, matters. It matters a great deal as a legally constructed and socially maintained driver of inequity. The question for us is: Are we, as a community, willing to grapple with racism? and to root it out where it is institutionalized, where it confers economic benefit, and where it creates social divisiveness. And because you're all here tonight, I feel optimistic that the resounding answer is yes. Today is a really important day. I was, I was um, uh, commiserating with, with Toby before this about uh, today at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, South Carolina Governor uh, Nikki Haley authorized the removal of the Confederate flag from the grounds of the state <laughs> capitol. This is a small but important step in erasing the symbol of intimidation and terror. And as South Carolina goes, so goes the rest of the south of it, Southeast eventually. So it seems appropriate and celebratory for us to gather here this evening to discuss racial and social inequity. Race is a fiction. Racism is not. I'll leave you to ponder that for a while uh, within the context of Toby's presentation here tonight and beyond. But for now, I would like to introduce Willette Jones, our extraordinary, incredibly valued board director, who will introduce tonight's guest speaker. Willette. <laughs> Good evening. It's with great honor and pleasure that I introduce our speaker on tonight. Dr. Toby Jenkins is an assistant professor of higher education at Georgia Southern University. Her work focuses on the utility of culture, contemporary culture, folk culture, and pop culture as a politic of social survival, a tool of social change in a transformative space of non-traditional knowledge production. She is also interested in the ways in which culture influences one's leadership proxy and sense of citizenship, social commitment. She has authored two books focused on the evolving ide ideologies of culture, family, and education in contemporary society. My culture, my color, myself. Heritage, resilience, and community in the lives of young adults, and family, community, and higher education. Dr. Jenkins spent 10 years working as a diversity and equity administrator in higher education. At the University of Maryland and Penn State, she planned educational events that invited campus artists and intellectuals such as Outkast, Maya Angelou, 
Ellie Weasel, Doug A.E. Fresh, and many other notables. In 2001, she created the Vision Culturing Mentoring Initiative, which offered interactive cultural learning experiences for local high school students at low performing schools in Prince's Prince George's County. Both programs received honors from the President of the United States and the Governor of Maryland. One of her primary goals of her work is to organize college students in various forms of social action working outside of the gates of campus. She has engaged college students in community-based organizing and creating community interventions throughout Pennsylvania, New Jersey, DC, Maryland, South Carolina, Tennessee, and over 25 countries throughout the world. She has worked as, as a professor at George Mason University, the University of Hawaii, and will be joining the faculty at Georgia Southern in the fall. Her motto is, don't spend your life searching for a hero, become one. And with that, Dr. Toby Jenkins. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me today. Um, I am a, a professor, I'm a scholar, writer, uh, community educator, uh, but first, the first thing I am is a, uh, a daughter of black folks in the South who um, wrestled with their experience through the arts. Uh, so one of the first spaces where I learned um, to uh, kind of tackle or deal with issues of, um, of racism and prejudice and, and just our, our social experience was on my grandparents' porch in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, listening to my grandfather recite his poetry and sing songs about slavery and freedom. And so, um, if you will allow me, I want to first open my lecture with a poem. We've got Black Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, Afros, cornrows, closed fists. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, cute phrases like, I woke up like this. We've got flashy cars, no sense of self. Designer clothes, no real wealth. We've got America raping our mind. The satisfaction of a societal quickie, then being left behind. We had Sojourner, Rivera, and that brave soul Ella. We've got young people that think life can't get any better. What we've got is grabbing at straws and nothing to drink. We've got to think and learn and work and yearn for nourishment that can't fit through the narrow walls of a straw. We've got to push and shake and bend and break the social laws that leave us behind, that encourages us to confine our hopes and dreams into narrow and dried up streams. Because I'm trying to feel pails of opportunity for my people to drink. I'm going down to the river, going in deep, willing to sink, just trying to quench your thirst. And I'll roll up these sleeves, and I'll hike up this skirt, and I'll wade through waters of hard work just to show you what you're worth. And I'll go in again and again, giving and giving. And I'll come out of rough seas, battered and cold, beaten down and shivering. And I'll hold up that pail. And I'll tell you to drink self-confidence. Drink spiritual repentance. Drink these skills that I'll help you to build. Drink and be educated. And even when you're full, I'm going to pour the water on you, because I can't stop until you're saturated, until you drown in a future that runs as long and deep as the Nile, until you're able to put boats on your river and be a guide to ghetto civilians, until you're able to give a ride to one or a million, until you're able to take my place and deliver the hopes and dreams of living up the river. And even if you live in a city or suburb that makes it hard for you to envision my words, because you don't see any oceans, there aren't any rivers around you. The wells of opportunity have run dry. Then we'll just have to try this in the kitchen sink. It's not a lot of water, but it's enough to drink. And we'll explore and seek opportunity anywhere we can, and we'll forget cups and pills. I'll catch it in my hand. And I'll tell you to drink knowledge, drink peace, and drink love. And once you're full, 
once you're hydrated, strong, and no longer tired, what we're going to do, we're going to start us a fire, create us a spark to ignite our desire, to want more, to do more, to be more for our people, to understand what it means to be free, not just equal. I don't want to be equal to people with hate in their hearts. If I have to cuddle up with racism and prejudice, I'd rather live apart. I'm talking about mental health creating a cultural agenda to take care of ourselves, that spiritual medicine for our racial pain, that loving acceptance to counter the social disdain, that empathetic knowledge of our struggles and stress, that beautiful history that we should never forget. Comfortable is never acceptable. Half empty still ain't full. Lukewarm won't kill a chill, and half the money won't pay the bill. <laughs> so forget progress. I'm, I want to take a moment to regress. What I want to do is go back to 1852, when Frederick Douglass asked America why. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, the question still the same. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Thank you. What to the slave? is the 4th of July. In 1852, Frederick Douglass posed this question as he delivered an Independence Day speech to the ladies of the Rochester Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, another important women's organization uh, of the time, similar to the uh, YWCA. And I'm sure they all expected him to speak on the beauty of and importance of independence. But instead, what he said to them was, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. His words spoke so much truth at that moment. It spoke to the hypocrisy of an escaped slave delivering an Independence Day speech during a time when this country had still not ended slavery. Slavery didn't end in the United States until December 6, 1865. So his main point was, how can we celebrate freedom when all of our citizens can't experience it? I start with Frederick Douglass today because he is a perfect example of having the courage to speak the truth. And 163 years later, I'm asking similar questions. How can we toast to progress when so many of our young people are further behind educationally than when we were being educated in cold, one-room, wooden schoolhouses? We've got big buildings and nice books that students can't even read because their schools are failing them. And I ask, is this progress? How can we celebrate freedom when a young boy can't walk to the store in his dad's neighborhood to buy candy and juice without being shot? And it makes me remember Emmett Till and wonder, is this progress? How can we celebrate freedom when nine innocent people can't simply gather and learn and pray together without being victim to prejudice, brutality, and violence. And it makes me remember those four little girls and wonder, is this progress? How can we celebrate freedom when this country goes from being a place in 1790 where any free white person could apply for citizenship after only two years of residency. Now, all they had to do was just stay here for two years, and they could become citizens. And then 60 years later, Africans were barred from citizenship with the Dred Scott decision. Almost 100 years later, the Chinese were barred from citizenship. 50 years later, the Japanese were barred from citizenship. And now, there's a nasty, growing national sentiment that is labeling any Latino person as an illegal, which the term itself is offensive. Right? Illegal is a, a, an act or a situation. It's not a person. Um, but any Latino person is an illegal. Any Latino person is Mexican. So whether you're um, Puerto Rican or Dominican or you know who cares, you're Mexican. And then any Mexican is inferior. So essentially, all Latino uh, people or Hispanic people are inferior. We're seeing another wave of immigration laws that will once again target a group to be barred. And I'm wondering, is this progress? And I have this picture of Dora here, because um, I, when I was looking for images for illegal immigration, I put the, word in, the terms in Google, and Dora the Explorer popped up. 
And I'm like, Dora? <laughs> Uh, but one of the things that I love about Google is that if you want to test what current stereotypes are, do a Google search for some, for some for, uh, stereotypical terms. It's a wonderful um, uh, like tool for, uh, for teaching stereotypes. So um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, preparing a class uh, on stereotypes, and I was looking for images of angry black woman. This is what pops up. You put an angry black woman, uh, Michelle Obama overwhelmingly pops up. So this is what we think of our first lady, right? Um, a few weeks ago, I, um, I've been teaching a, uh, a summer course uh, for Upward Bound. And um, I, the, one of the assignments that I gave my students was to um, find an image on the internet that um, uh, is representative of how the, our country what our country thinks of you. So thinking about your age, your race, and your gender, what does America think of you, right? So there was a 15-year-old African-American young man, um, and he was wrestling with it. He, he was really having a problem with it. He was like, well, I don't know what America thinks of me, but I know what I think about African-Americans. I think that we're um, really caring people. And so I was like, OK, Google caring. This is what came up overwhelmingly. So when you put in the word caring, um, white hands um, reaching out or white hands holding each other overwhelmingly comes up with caring. And the only time that people of color are really represented in, in the, the, those picture galleries is like this. So they're being helped. It's a white person helping them. Google is a wonderful space to explore so social stereotypes. <laughs> and understand stereotypes matter. Stereotypes are the seeds of prejudice, and prejudice is what creates racism. So it's when someone begins to believe stereotypes and starts to develop prejudiced thoughts, and then that person is given power, like a job teaching kids, or a job running a company, or a job hiring employees, that they can begin to act based on their prejudiced beliefs. That's racism, and that's dangerous. It's more dangerous for a prejudiced teacher to teach a child than it was for that child to be taught with substandard materials. Now let me say that again. It's more dangerous for a prejudiced teacher to teach a child than it was for that child to be taught with substandard materials. What I know from my work focusing on colored schools is that young people that came out of those experiences with a high sense of self-efficacy and cultural pride. So they may have known that their educational resources were subpar, but at least they didn't feel that they as a people were subpar. And that's not happening anymore. This concerns me not just as an educator, but most importantly, as a mother. This is my baby. <laughs> He's a sweet, cute, loving little black boy. And as happy as I was to bring him into the world, I'm scared about the world in which he will live. Because this is what I think our society thinks of young African American men. As a black mother, I'm not just thinking about what to feed him, what to read him, what learning activities to use to grow his basic skills. Now, understand, no doubt, I'm thinking about that stuff. But that's not all I have to worry about. I'm thinking about how it's not academically safe for him in public schools, because black and brown children are being left behind. Uh, now I shared, I just I worked with um, low-income first-generation students this summer, and several of them had GPAs over a 4.0 and could barely write a cohesive sentence. Now, how does that happen? One student shared that she didn't write one paper her entire junior year in high school. How is that possible? I don't want that for my child. But I also don't want him in a private school where he's made to feel culturally isolated and racially ostracized. I'm thinking about what communities can we live in where he can be safe and free to be a, a wondering and exploring little boy without being racially profiled by the police. I'm thinking about what state can I raise him in where he will be exposed to positive experiences with all cultures, especially his own. I'm thinking about how can I counter the ways that music and television might limit his perspective and encourage him to think negatively about himself and negatively about black girls who are the cultural reflection of his own mother. 
that what is meant to entertain him and bring him joy might subliminally teach him to think that girls that look like me aren't beautiful. They are ratchet and worthless. And the question we should be asking is why am I having to think about this in 2015? Black and brown mamas are still worrying about their sons being safe in America because we have moved forward and have gotten nowhere. We're moving at horse and buggy pace when it comes to social justice. We've made advances in so many other sectors of life. This is a world where in one day, I can take the same trip across the Atlantic that it took my African ancestors months to endure. Not factoring in time zones, I can now travel from Senegal to South Carolina in one day. 40 years ago, we couldn't imagine having the kind of access to information that we now have. Uh, I'm turning 40 in September, and my parents were still buying encyclopedias when I was a child. That was family access to knowledge. Now we can Google anything we want to know as we walk, sit in our cars, lay on the couch, lay in the bed. In the 1950s and 60s, that was when uh, um, the television watching or buying TVs actually um, started to take off. And uh, now 50 years later, everyone in here can pull a TV out of their pocket or purse and watch it in the palm of their hands. We have literally been witness to a technology revolution. But when it comes to uh, things that truly matter in people's lives or changing their situations like education, economics, employment opportunity, we're standing still. In the 40 years that I have been on this earth, the black and white unemployment rates have barely changed. So in my poem, that's why I say, forget making progress. Um, if my goal, there you go, the door's open, perfect, thank you whoever opened that door. If my goal is to feel the fresh air outside, right, I can start here. Did you use the microphone? Oh, yeah, where's my, um, <laughs> sorry about that. If my goal is to, to, to feel the fresh air outside, I can start right here and end right here, and I'm making progress. But I'm still a far, far away from the door. Okay? So I don't, I'm not interested in progress. I want change, a revolution, complete and total change. And I strongly feel that we shouldn't be satisfied until we see it. In real life, forget dreams. I have dreams every night. I don't need them during the day. Right? I, I, it's time for us to wake up, which brings me to coffee. Now, I'm a professor and writer, and I spend a lot of time working uh, in cafes and coffee shops. And with a, a, a one-year-old <laughs> and, and a husband who loves CNN, I mean, no, not CNN, uh, ESPN, <laughs> Um, I have to get away from the house. So I, I spend a lot of time uh, working in cafes. And needless to say, I love me some coffee. In my purse, I carry my own stevia, you know, the sh sugar alternative, and a straw to prevent stained teeth. It's serious. <laughs> but admittedly, I'm one of those foo-foo coffee drinkers. Give me a latte with a few pumps of caramel, vanilla, or a little white chocolate mocha. And this pulls me back to one of my favorite quotes by Malcolm X. Speaking on the need for strong and powerful activism, he said, it's just like when you've got uh, some coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong. What do you do? You integrate it with cream. You make it weak. But if you pour too much cream in it, you won't even know you ever had coffee. It used to be hot. It becomes cool. It used to be strong. It becomes weak. It used to wake you up. Now it just puts you to sleep. Now that's the truth. After going through nine months of sleepless nights caring for a newborn, these lattes don't cut it anymore. When I drink a grande, uh, when I drink a grande vanilla latte, I immediately yawn when I'm done now. And the reality is when it comes to our world, these lukewarm, privileged, comfortable responses to injustice also won't cut it anymore. The main issue, as I see it, is that we never really addressed our racial problems in the United States. How can you come out of a past as dark as ours and expect everyone to just simply adjust and move on? Now, I'm going to do another little demonstration. If we were to turn out the lights, and so my husband's going to help me out a little bit and, um, and turn the lights out for us. 
Okay, so if we turn off the lights, when we dr drastically change your situation, it takes some time for your eyes to adjust, right? And if I were to ask you to just carry on, just continue taking notes, jotting down notes as I talk, the first thing that you would say is, I can't see exactly. Can you turn the lights back on? Thank you. After the Civil Rights Movement, we dramatically changed folks' situation in our country. We changed laws and threw us all together without acknowledging that we didn't truly know how to live together. We didn't allow time for people to truly adjust their eyes to a new racial reality. We changed policies and called it equality. And all folks did was figure out new ways to live separately and maintain the status quo. Blatant racism turned into institutional racism and became a much hard, harder concept to battle. We didn't allow time for people to heal, for people to share their pain and purge their prejudice, for people to have real and honest talks about what they believe, what they have been taught, and what they still didn't know about each other. I'm reading a book right now uh, about the integration of uh, neighborhoods in Detroit. And it's telling the story of uh, black folks moving north during the Great Migration and then eventually moving out of the, uh, the black bottoms in, in, in northern cities into white neighborhoods and the sheer terror that they faced. Now, it, it wasn't just hate for black folks that drove the white neighbors to form mobs and terrorize anyone that dared to move into a white community. It was also the belief that black people will drive down property values. As soon as a few black families move in, what happens? White families move out, and the neighborhood becomes a ghetto, or, or it's perceived as a ghetto. Now, can anyone in here look me in the face and tell me that in 2015, people still don't feel this way? The recent video on Facebook of a police officer slamming a young black girl down at a pool party after white parents at the community pool complained and harassed the kids, telling them to go back to the projects shows us our progress. There is an immediate belief that one or two is OK, but too much black and brown gathered in one place is a problem. They don't belong. This is the result of not admitting and dealing with our racial past, of putting on a good face and living a fantasy. Many of us do it in our personal lives. We have failing marriages and dysfunctional homes, but we put on a fake and phony face in public so no one will know. We do it well because our country showed us how. We hide behind the facade of fabulous lives, well-manicured lawns, the concepts of the home of the free and the uh, land of the brave, yet we aren't even brave enough to have real and honest conversation about our shortcomings as a nation. If we are too scared to even talk, how can we have the courage to do something as drastic as change? Have you ever heard of the phrase, Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. I love the saying. Lilies are beautiful flowers, and they're actually my favorite flower. I, I love lilies. Um, and weeds, of course, are eyesores. You, you see a picture there. They're ugly, and they pop up everywhere. But the thing is, as beautiful as lilies look, if you leave them unattended in water and let them wilt and die and never throw them out, they start to smell. They will stink up. That beautiful flower will stink up your whole house. Now, weeds might be ugly, but they don't stink. This is what's happening in our country. It looks pretty on the outside, but we have let our racial issues fester, unattended, and it's now stinking up our country. No gated communities or superficial lifestyles can cover up the stink. You can't free breeze it away. If you change the water, the new water will eventually stink too. You have to throw it out, get rid of it. And so that's why I'd rather deal with weeds. I'd rather deal, have it all out in the open and deal with the ugly and so that we have the, uh, an urgency to uproot it. Race has been so much a factor in the fabric of America. How can we believe that it would just disappear with time? Now, right now, I share with y'all, I have a, oh, he's one now. Um, and I still haven't lost all my, ba my baby weight. I have about 15 pounds to go. Now, should I believe that in a few years, the weight will simply go away without me doing anything? That would be lovely. <laughs> but it's not going to happen. I mean, let's be real here. This is a place 
where folks used to bring a beer and a blanket to watch black men be burned at the stake. This is what selfies used to look like in the United States. And we're supposed to believe that everything just suddenly became okay because time passed and laws were changed. Laws change behavior, they don't change hearts and minds. And the very space that could do that, our education system, constantly falls short. As an educator, I really don't understand how a student can go through 12 years of public school in this country and not study race in a full and intentional way. Why are most of my students taking, talking about it or learning about it for the first time in college? We need to talk about it. Sponsoring spaces like this is important. Places for communities to gather and face race. Years ago, I heard um, uh, Dr. Cornel West speak and he used this phrase, uh, lovingly challenge, and I adopted it as a way of, of being. I lovingly question policies and administrative structures at my institution. I push for change. We need to do this in all of our spaces where we have the power. Lovingly challenge your companies, your schools, neighbors, friends, family members. And this doesn't require you to be in a constant state of rage. That'll kill you. You might kill a policy or a stereotype, but when you're mad all the time, you kill a little bit of yourself as well. So I'm not talking about raging against the machine. What I'm talking about is us learning how to be brave enough to bring it up and loving enough to push our friends, families, coworkers, and colleagues without pushing them away. You might not be able to change the world, but if you can't even work on your own family, there's a problem there. If you can't encourage a positive change in the minds of your friends, that's a waste of friendship to me. This is why I love social media as much as I love Google. <laughs> Times like these help you to truly know who your friends are. And I don't mean who is your friend. I mean who your friends truly are, what they think and believe. We can't say it's only ignorant, uneducated Americans who have prejudiced thoughts anymore. Now, like I said, I'm a, I'm a professor. Most of my Facebook friends, uh, my friends list is full of folks um, that are highly educated, you know, college degrees and, um, you know, big jobs and titles and, and uh, professionals and very successful in traditional terms. But my feed was bombarded with folks calling rioters in Missouri and Baltimore savages. Savages and animals. This stuff has gotten people to be real honest about what they actually think. I was shocked that people I knew and their friends were referring to African Americans as animals that needed to be exterminated. Now these are educated adults in their 30s and 40s. So why would we be surprised that a young 21 year old would walk into that church thinking the way that he did? We have issues y'all that we need to deal with. But see, the first step in any process of recovery is admitting you have a problem. That's why in the important um, organization, Alcoholics Anonymous, it always starts with, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic. You have to acknowledge what you need to change. You have to admit it, talk about it, say it out loud. Social media has made folks brave in a cowardly sort of way. You can post comments without fear for your life. So many people are daring to actually say out loud the ignorant things they actually think. And as a race educator, I actually think that's good. We need spaces of honesty so that we can see how bad a problem race is in America. I can't get anywhere with educating prejudice out of folks if everyone is sitting around being politically correct and uh, dishonest. Realness is what we need. I'm a breast cancer survivor, and I'm also a lupus patient. And I know for sure that a doctor can't help a patient who lies to them. You have to tell them the truth about what you smoke, what you drink, what you eat, in order for them to actually cure you. Same thing with race. We have to create spaces where we can fully and honestly purge our prejudice. And we need to be honest. Many of our own friends are prejudiced in classes. We have work to do on our social circles, and you absolutely have the power to create change there. But too often, we shrink away. 
from having truly challenging, life-changing, and intense conversations with our friends or colleagues, because we don't want to be seen as a constant complainer and disruptor. Nothing spoils a party like that angry, radical, fight the fire, power friend. And on the job, there's the added weight of being labeled the angry uh, woman or man. So we choose to push and challenge we, uh, when we choose to push and challenge at work. So we don't want to be the voice of disagreement, blaming everything on racism. We're often so committed to wearing our hard-earned professionalism and privilege with dignity and honor that we simply don't want to come off as rude and radical. I'm not suggesting we need to harass or be hostile, but we do need to take a stand or simply just stand up. John Henry Clark once said that in order for someone to walk over you, it requires you to bend in order to balance them on your back. It's only when you stand up that you can knock oppression off of your back. They may not have been perfect and eloquent in their approach, but if those young people had not taken to the streets in Missouri and New York City and Baltimore, places like my home state of South Carolina, would have, who've held on to its racist, racist heritage so tightly um, for so many years, they would never have moved so swiftly to denounce and take down that Confederate flag. They don't want any part of riots down there. These are the days when cities burn. And even when that flag comes down tomorrow, that's still only progress. It's just a step. We aren't at that door feeling the breeze until minds are educated, hearts are changed, there's true economic and criminal justice, and we have quality public education across zip codes. As a citizen, I love my country like a mother loves a child. And I started this, this realm of thought many years ago um, when I started getting fed up with people um, privileging certain forms of patriotism. So like, you know, I work in colleges and um, administration always seemed to, um, to privilege those students that, I worked at Penn State, right? So the, their thing is you bleed blue and white. Um, so they love those students. Those students that, you know, just would paint their faces and at every game and, you know, wore the, the paraphernalia uh, and, and, and did all the right things, you know, were in the right organizations, um, talked about how much their love of, of uh, dear old state. Administration loved those students. And they hated the students that were always protesting against the campus. <laughs> the ones that were always like, well, this policy needs to change, and why are y'all doing this, and this isn't fair, and this isn't right. They hated them. And I was like, you know what? I'm the director of the Cultural Center here. And one thing I know for sure is that my center is here because students protested to get it here. I have a job because those students took to the pavement and protested to create spaces on campus that were culturally equal. And so, I question what patriotism really means. Because for me, those students that have, from their activism, comes real resources. I mean, they have created buildings on campus, jobs, workshops, programs. And we're privileging these students that simply just go to the game. You know, those are the patriots. Those activist students were the patriots to me. And so I started this, this realm of thought about thinking about how how a mother loves a child. And you love your child so much that you don't want to see her do wrong. And so you discipline and correct every wrong turn. We correct our children out of love. So why don't we see people who take that same approach outside of their family as being the true patriots? If we were to see a child acting out in public, the first question we ask is, where are the parents? And we often negatively judge their parental abilities. So why don't we do the same thing to citizens who live blindly in our country, who take no interest in truly learning our country's history, who don't make any effort to change the ills of society? Why don't we judge their lack of critical and deep engagement as citizens? Making any entity better, whether it is a school, a company, or a country, is not achieved through rhetoric that makes us feel good but rather through action and calls to action that inspire us to do good. I'm quoting Dr. King here. He said, and I quote, I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. 
I have been gravely disappointed with the moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. This brings me to Moscato's. These are the days when fabulous folks order bottles of Moscato at their dinner. Now this makes me laugh because Moscato is a sweet wine meant to be paired with dessert or a small plate of fruit and cheese. It's not dinner wine. Now, I know y'all are Californians. Y'all take wine seriously, so y'all already know this. But my generation, mm -mm, we need watered down wine, essentially juice with a little bit of alcohol because we can't take the bitterness, earthiness, and boldness of dinner wine. To prep this speech, or um, the, actually an article that motivated this speech, I did a quick search, again on Google, to, for Moscato. And one of the first hits was an article that shared the fact that African Americans and Latinos were overwhelmingly embraced uh, Moscato as their wine of choice. And the author goes on to say, but despite Moscato's popularity, the strange thing about hip hop's fascination with the beverage is that the wine is not at all high end. It's a relatively cheap white wine made from the Muscat grape. And Moscato is really sweet and has low alcohol content. Sweet enough and weak enough, in fact, to make a wine drinker out of anyone. People who don't think of themselves as wine drinkers, who are intimidated by the idea of a wine tasting, who would never ever search out earthy tones and a deep red, those people drink Moscato. <laughs> sweet enough and weak enough to make a wine drinker out of anyone. It's so easy to be a lukewarm revolutionary. We love throwing a fundraising event that allows us to dress to impress. We love developing a scholarship, often for our own kids. We, we run willingly to a park cleanup. We throw ice over ourselves uh, and, uh, as a form of protest and change our profile picture. And you know, here, here's me wearing a hoodie. <laughs> here's me with my hands up. The reality is work for justice often isn't pretty, fabulous, or tasty. Creating social change is often ugly, grueling, and tiring, but it's also life-changing. This is the work that makes history. Marilyn Fry gave the best visual analogy of how overwhelming oppression really is when she compared it to a birdcage. Now, if you look at the cage from a microscopic point of view, you only see one little wire and you wonder why the bird doesn't just fly out, right? It's just white space all around. It's, you're not trapped, just fly, fly out, fly, fly around the black, um, the black line. But it's only when you stand back and take a macroscopic view of the cage that you see just how trapped that bird really is. The same is the case with oppression. It's not as simple as individual motivation. It's, it's a more complex system of policies, practices, and structures that keep many folks on the margins of our societies. And it will take hard, grueling work in every field of endeavor to create change. Economics, education, social services, medicine, criminal justice, psychology, the arts, law, all of us have a role to play in changing our society and dismantling racism and classism. Fighting for justice has never been nice and easy. Ask the abolition, abolitionists how ugly that fight is. Talk to Harriet Tubman about the gulliness of the work. Have a conversation with Ella Baker about community commitment. Sit it with Dr. King in a jail cell or a hospital room. Confer with Malcolm as he watches over his family with a shotgun. Interview the suffragists. Reach out to the Black Panthers and Black Liberation Party members who are still living in exile or in prison. Walk with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers who immediately would start up a new protest after each victory was won, La Lucha Continua. It's time to put down the Moscatos and pick up an adult beverage. Please don't fall asleep now. It's time to wake up and to go to work. And I know that many of us are wondering, well, what can we do? How can we turn something as massive a beast as racism around? And maybe you don't feel you're qualified to work on race. We need a large leader to win the fight. Maybe you fear it's too big of a monster for a regular person to tackle. But when I was a child, I heard a story about a small young man named David and a big intimidating giant named Goliath. That story reminds us that nothing is too large for us to tackle. Maybe you don't feel you know enough 
haven't learned enough to challenge others on race. Well, I ran across a blog called Cordelia Calls It Quits that reminds me about a, a few regular people. It reminded me of a few regular people who did some pretty incredible things under limited circumstances and limited abilities. People like Helen Keller, who was deaf and blind. But she not only learned sign language, but earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree, wrote 12 books and numerous articles was a fundraiser for the blind, campaigned for many liberal causes, including women's suffrage and workers' rights. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Now, no one would have faulted her for living a quiet life of solitude, given her, um, her disabilities, but she didn't. Beethoven began to lose his sight, his hearing, at the height of his career, and eventually became completely deaf. And what did he do in response? He sawed the legs off of his piano so he could sit it on the floor and feel the vibrations as he played. His symphony number no. nine, of which he never heard a single note, is one of the best known works of classical mu music. Regardless of the circumstances, he kept going. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years as a political prisoner. He became a leader among his fellow inmates, fighting for better treatment, better food, study privileges. He earned his BA while in prison through a correspondence course. Even when they put him in prison, he fought for justice for the inmates. He was an agent for social change in whatever space he occupied. And he kept learning. If you don't know enough, teach yourself. It's never too late to learn. Read more books. Educate yourself on race. Carter G. Whitson once said, Philosophers have long conceded that every man has two educations, that which is given to him and that which he gives himself. Of the two kinds, the latter is by far the more desirable. Indeed, all that is most worthy in man, he must work out and conquer for himself. What we are merely taught seldom nourishes the mind like that which we teach ourselves. This is still true. In the early 1900s, he was arguing for education that didn't miseducate students, that taught them about all cultures, that honestly taught history, and that taught about race and oppression. We still aren't learning these things. So we have to read and learn for ourselves. We have to create uh, an intentional reading agenda for our families, our whole families, parents and children. And then there's this man. He has been my motivation since I was about 18 years old when I first saw this picture. Now, when I first went to college, um, one of the things that I did was, because I'm, I'm, I've never been a morning person. I don't like waking up in the morning. And uh, when I found out in college that you could like set your own schedule and you never had to wake up early again, like that was like amazing to me. But it was, um, I wasn't a big class goer. Like I didn't really like going to class. And so one of the things that I did was I had two large um, uh, posters on my wall. Uh, one of, of Martin Luther King in his I Have a Dream speech, and the other was of um, this slave named Gordon. And whenever I would roll over and think about missing class, I'd look at those, those posters and get up. Um, this, um, this picture is um, the runaway slave Gordon. And the story says that he escaped from a Louisiana plantation by using a sack of onions to throw off the dogs. He constantly rubbed onions all over his body after crossing each creek. He eventually made it to a Union camp and joined as a colored Union soldier. They took this photo at the camp. I'm not really focused on his bravery to escape. I just know that the regular living slave was an extraordinary person. To simply wake up each day and live to live even though your life wasn't your own was an act of resistance. It showed vision. Because they simply survived, they allowed our race to survive. I stand here today simply because my ancestors chose to live. All it takes is meaningful acts, not big ones. Mahatma Gandhi gave us the best answer to what we can do. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Be the voice of justice in your social circles. Be the servant of justice through whatever work you do. Be more vocal in your local schools. You pay taxes there. Become more active in your local community. 
If you can't write a book, write a letter to someone in your life who needs to think differently. If you aren't going to give lectures, simply lead a discussion at dinner with your own family. Don't just raise your kids not to be racist. Raise them to be active agents of social change. There's a difference. We don't need a spokesperson or a leader for the movement. What we need is you. Don't spend your life searching for heroes. Become one. Thank you. set up on either side of, of the aisles. Does anybody have any questions or, or comments they want to put out there on the floor for either us as a community or uh, to Toby? <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll kick it off for, for one, and, and maybe this is you know for Toby to ponder and, and for us as a group. So we know in this community, we have this thing on Highway 68 called the Lettuce Curtain. And it's very unusual for people for, on this side of the peninsula to even want to go to Salinas. There, it's a strange culture. And uh, there are, uh, it's, a, it's a, a town that is predominantly Hispanic and Latino. And it has a reputation for gang violence, just as any city has a problem in certain parts. Salinas is a lovely, awesome, culturally interesting and vibrant town. And yet we can't even get our act together in this community to, to speak with a unified voice. We have a police department that is perceived to be over-militarized, that has Perception is reality, right? That has vehicles that make a Humvee look like uh, a clown car. They're so huge. We have a problem advocating for young black and Latino men and boys in our own community. How can we do the grueling, ugly work in a small town when we can't even get over the lettuce curtain to, to care. This is the, the daily struggle, the daily conversation that we have at the office, and that is unspoken in our community. How can we do this? Yeah. Wow, that, I mean, that's a, 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 yeah, a huge question. I don't have the, the answer to it. But you know, one of the things that immediately comes to my mind um, in the introduction, they shared how I do a lot of, um, I sponsor a lot of field excursions for students uh, to go to other countries and, and do work and everything. And, and one of the things I talk about with every group that, uh, with whom I work, is uh, you know you, we, we can do this right here in, you know, where we came from. <laughs> we don't have to, to travel across the ocean to, to do uh, good work. And so, um, you know, sometimes, it may be as simple as organi whatever organizations, community organizations, um, you know, it, it seems, uh, you know, big and fancy to organize a trip going somewhere else, but sometimes we need to uh, organize cultural learning excursions to the, the, the lettuce curtain. You mm -hmm. know, or, or, I'm sorry, am, I, am I saying it right? Yeah. Lettuce yeah. Curtain. yeah. Um, where we can have some, in, uh, create some as intentional space uh, to truly learn about the culture and uh, appreciate the cultural differences, um, to create some uh, lasting relationships uh, and, and bonds that can uh, continue to move on. And so, um, you know, I think a, a piece of it, uh, I, I always learn as an educator uh, who's uh, organizing the, those programs. Uh, and so, of course, the, the professionals that are, are working on it uh, would, would gain some, um, some life-changing experience, but definitely, the more that you're exposing the young people in this community mm -hmm. uh, to learning, not going and helping anybody, but going and being a learner in those communities right. and seeing them as, or in their culture and their histories as valuable 
uh, pieces of knowledge that we need to learn uh, to help advance our lives. I'm going to take that to heart and staff members, we're on it. <laughs> oh, you're saying my, the, the South Carolina? The, so, so my husband's here like mouthing to me, share, whatever, I'm like, what? Uh, so uh, many years ago, so I'm from a, a, a Columbia, South Carolina, a neighborhood that um, has definitely uh, going down. So when I was uh, uh, growing up there as a child, it was a wonderful um, space. Um, in the book that I hope y'all might buy out there, um, I, <laughs> I talk about um, how it was a place where when I graduated from college and I accepted this job at Oscar Mayer, Oscar Mayer was in Wisconsin, um, and um, I was um, set to go to the airport to you know fly out and move to Wisconsin. And um, I had a really early flight, and it was like 6 o'clock in the morning. My parents were taking me to the airport. And I'm driving up the street, and all of my neighbors are on their porches waving. You know, they've gotten up and, and just to see me off. Oh. That's how wonderful the neighborhood is. But over the years, um, slumlords bought up the, the community. I started renting it to um, to people that they you know they didn't live you know when when investors don't own the community and they don't live there don't care um, about it um, a lot of crime um, economic infrastructure goes out there's not a lot of jobs um, and so you know it's it's just like any other um, community in America um, that that has gone down um, but I feel strongly that it's not about um, making it out of communities like that. So I can say, oh, look, I, this is where I came from and I made it out. Um, or I'm going to go and give back. No, I want to make it better. I don't want to make it out. I want to make it better. And so um, I um, made a commitment to investing back in my own neighborhood. So even though um, I you know, just came from Hawaii, but um, for, for years we have a house in DC and we were living in DC and everything. Um, but I still, we still bought a home on my block um, to invest in that community. And the, the whole goal is to, um, to uh, buy the block and um, to create a space where um, all of us um, that have long ties in that community can begin to, uh, to steward the change in that, in that community. I've created courses. When, um, when she talked about uh, me uh, creating programs um, that do work in South Carolina, um, the, when I was teaching at George Mason in DC, I brought students from D.C. Uh, down to South Carolina uh, to work with us in, the, in that community. So I wanted them to see the investment that I was making in my own community. Um, and we uh, you know, spent a, a week working with the, um, the, 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 uh, the neighbors there, the elderly neighbors, doing uh, community um, like house projects and cleaning up yards and things like that, but also having some real fun conversations with politicians, with community leaders about uh, community redevelopment and cultural sustainability. Um, like how can you redevelop a community without losing uh, the cultural life mm -hmm. and cultural uh, 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 heritage of that community? So not gentrification, but, uh, but true community redevelopment um, that's grassroots in nature. Um, so uh, I, I try really hard to, to practice you know, um, what I'm preaching. So, you know, to, um, to find ways that I can use my resources. My resources are university dollars and um, young hands. I have a, a lot of students that take my classes. And so if I can't um, galvanize those students into um, to doing and use their, um, their energy and talents uh, to doing some good work while they're in, in school and hopefully change their minds as they're um, developing as professionals, um, uh, then I, I feel like my, my job is wasted. I'm not just there to, to, to come and babysit and teach for, you know, three hours. It's about really creating life-changing work. That's awesome. I'm Hibbert Olson, and uh, recently took a... I'm speaking into the mic. I can't hear you, Hibbert. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I didn't solve the problem. She did. 
which doesn't feel good to me, but that's you know, not a criticism of you. <laughs> it's a criticism of me. Um, my name is Herbert Olson, and I w recently took a tr uh, trip on a boat, and I was disappointed that to, to Southeast Asia, and we really didn't get to meet with people in Southeast Asia, and it was supposed to be an educational trip. So I had the gall to criticize the company after all that. And, but I'm also reading books that we tend to communicate on very shallow levels. And that's a major problem. And I, so I would like to see Google changed. And what I'd like to see is that I can put in that I would like to see the viewpoint from an African-American point of view of blank or a Chinese point of view of blank, or a Japanese point of view of blank. And I think that if that were available, that would vastly increase the experiences. Because I know in my family, I was taught that there's one way to think the way those people think. And the world is not that way. It's a, there are a lot of different ways of looking at the same thing. Indeed. That's fantastic. And I think that it should be called the Lens Project. <laughs> you know, like the lens, like different lens. Uh -huh. And somebody needs to, <laughs> to take that on. <laughs> you know, cause that, that seems well, like it would be incredible. Yeah, oh, no, I, I got this one. You got it working? Oh, good. Well, wonderful. <laughs> I can't tell. Well, is, is this working? This yes. one's working. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your presentation and for coming to our community. Um, can I do two questions? Is that all right? OK, we are getting permission. <laughs> OK. Um, let's see. Can I read what I said here? Um, oh, yeah, I want to know about so your experience as a, um, as a professor at, at your school. I was, I was struck by what you were talking about, um, the, the patriotism story you were talking about, you know, dressing up and, you know, and those who are, who, who are, who are disrupting for a cause. <laughs> so I guess what I, what I want to know is, um, can you tell us anything about your experience of, of how to get administ administrators, so I'm talking about school, but it's applications everywhere else, to value the disruptors? Yeah, so if you have any words about, about what you think about how to get people to think, oh, no, this is a good thing, that, that we've got that. And the other thing that I, I wanted to kind of reverse the question um, that this lady um, uh, spoke, which, which seemed more about, uh, well, to be frank, we're seeing more about white people coming into um, mixed areas. And, you know, at, at, uh, I'm at the, the university here. And so we always, on that side of the peninsula, we're always having these multicultural conversations. And I'm always think, struck by how that's always happening in the multicultural side of town. <laughs> you know? And it seems to me that the most uh, segregated folks around here, in a sense, are affluent white people. Right? So they, can, they might go and have some experience in Salinas and so forth. But meanwhile, our students are not having experiences in Carmel or in Pebble Beach. And so, do you have any thoughts about whether or not that's valuable? Okay, so I, I'll go with the first one. Um, I, I think the, the main thing is just to, to say it to them. You know, uh, so um, when I talk about the, the Cornell West thing, lovingly challenged. So when I say that I adopted that as a way of being, I really did. I was trying to wrestle with, and my, my husband can, can vouch for me on this. I am typically a very direct person, right? And so I uh, uh, spent a lot of time working on how to uh, be able to, oh, it's not working? Oh. How to, oh, that's much better. Um, to push and challenge people in a way that they could receive it. Uh, and uh, to uh, still stay, stand strong with what I'm saying 
uh, but to say in a, a, a loving or, or, or kind way, um, or just to have a, 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 a countenance about myself that's, um, that's receptive. And a lot of that um, takes relationship building. Um, but one of the things that um, I, I did, uh, so at Penn State I was the director of the cultural center. And so, um, again, I felt strongly that that's what I was there for. You know, um, so, and, and too often on college campuses, uh, folks will be in positions like that and feel that intimidated that they can't advocate for the very groups of students that they were supposed to be hired to advocate for. And they'll sit silent in meetings and not say anything. Um, and to me, that's a, a waste of space because that's what you're there for. And so, um, as we had senior cabinet or senior you know leadership um, meetings with the vice president she was the one that was just like you know she she couldn't take any type of um, of, uh, of, of protest or, or anything whatever um, but I would I would be the only one uh, all of the directors in student affairs sitting around the table to advise the vice president about what to do about um, the, the the protests that are happening on campus and I would be the only one that would have a different voice or, or a different perspective in the way to view it. And you know, one of the things I talked to them about was um, you, places like this or places like, like that, that university have long uh, legacies and, um, and students love their experience there. And it was like, you know, um, like having a legacy here is such a big deal. People wanna talk about what their times were like in college. And it was like, what well, the reality is Y'all don't have anything for those students to talk about. Their legacy is the times that they're protesting and, and that's what they get together. As alumni, that's what they get together and talk about, the good times when they were uh, protesting on the, <laughs> the, the old main uh, building. And it was like, you know, they need more. We need more resources. We need um, more positive things that the institution is building that the institution is providing, that's not rel um, relying on students to create everything, every program, every, you know, but that we're giving them, we need to give them an alternative experience. But we also need to know that we went to school to do this. Like we went to school to learn about college student development and racial identity and all this stuff, or whatever. So we should be shocked when we see it happen. You know, we need to be loving guides and, um, and, and truly advise these students and work with them. And even if you think that they're being, you know, disrespectful, one of the things that I, I teach a course on this whole um, activism and everything, and one of the things I talk about was that, you know, you're talking about an 18-year-old who this might be the first time that they are able to challenge authority. So they might not get it right. You know, they're coming from high school where if you challenge authority, you might be kicked out, you know, with zero policy, uh, tolerance policies. Um, or a house where their parents might not, you know, <laughs> allow them to challenge them. So this is the first time that they can just challenge an adult. And so they, they might not have been trained to do it well. It's up to us to do that. We can work with them, we can train them, we can um, help them to, uh, to learn how to uh, respectfully you know, address people and, and things like that, but we can't label them enemy uh, because what they really are doing is changing our institutions for the better. Um, and we need to be asking them more about what are the problems than um, just trying to silence them. Um, so I think it's really, um, you know, Cheryl brought the, the, the word up, and I, I said it again in my speech, it's courage. It's just having the courage to speak. Um, and I, I can't say that without also acknowledging that that also takes a, um, a, 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 um, a commitment as a professional. So um, at that time, I will admit, I was single, um, and my bills were paid, my car was paid, <laughs> you know, I made sure, okay. and because those things enslave you to a job, and they, 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 those are the things that make you get quiet, because <laughs> you don't want to lose your job. And so um, I created a, a life situation where I was essentially free to do the work that I felt that I needed to, um, to be able to do. And so my um, stance was always, fire me if you will, but I doubt that you will, mm -hmm. you know, um, because you need me. And, and it became a, a thing, like after five years of being there, I, I might have been the only one, but they, they wanted to hear what I had to think. They, you know, and, and when I interview 
for jobs now and they ask you that little question, well, what would your coworkers say about you? I just, I, and, and my answer is always, they're, they're going to tell you that you're, you're not going to like what she has to say when she's at the table, but she has to be at the table. You know, and that takes courage, just constantly um, you know, speaking and, um, and, and, and building in yourself a, a, a confidence to be able to know that, uh, that it's okay to, to be the divergent voice um, at the table, because um, ultimately I think that's why we, we are supposed to be there. Um, then the other question about um, uh, switching it around and, um, and, and providing these spaces, you know, I, th I think it, that's really important. I think it's important for everyone to have experiences outside of their own um, and for us to create opportunities um, for that to happen. So um, you're, you're right, like why, why um, even now, like it would be very easy to partner with uh, a community organization um, uh, in another area and, uh, and say, you know what, let's get together and um, sponsor the vans and we're going to um, sponsor van rides, you know, and just bring, you know, 40 people um, over here for this talk on race into this community. You know, and then let's, let's um, follow it up with a, a program called Breaking Bread and we're going to um, all sit down over dinner and just talk, uh, discuss the, 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 um, what the speaker talked about. Um, after the speech, right? So then you have some more engagement and you're getting them out into, you know, the, the community, whatever. But we can really be strategic about um, going in and out of these, these invisible borders that we've created um, across these communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I ran a cultural center. I can come up with ideas for days for <laughs> programs. Can you hear me now? No, ma'am. Hello. Hello. I have it. Uh, you know when the uh, nine people was murdered in the church in Charleston? Not one of the churches here on the Monterey Peninsula called a meeting together to talk about what happened there in Charleston, South Carolina. How can we get the churches to not be so confirmed in their churches, especially when they have members that don't get out in the community and support nothing in the community? And all of the ministers have to do is say, hey, we're going to go here and we're going to support that. But they don't do that. So how can we get the churches and the members to realize that we have not overcome? Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I said that same thing a, a couple years ago, and I, I think it, it's really a, a question of, it's, it's more of a statement. We need to get the churches um, to become uh, more, more in, involved. The, the, the thing I, 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 I feel about the church is that more and more um, we're losing public spaces. You know, that's why I was saying uh, programs like this are important because it's a space for, you know, local communities to gather and talk about a topic or whatever. But, like, more and more we're, we're losing that, um, these community town halls and um, the, the roles that the, um, the, the YWCA and YMCA, like, all these, these organizations um, that, you know, maybe 40 years ago um, were, were really bringing large groups of people together. Um, we're, we're not seeing that anymore. And one of the only spaces that still exists that on a weekly basis gathers hundreds, sometimes thousands of people is church. Yeah. It's yeah. the only space where people gather. It's the most segregated on, at 11 o'clock every Sunday. It's the most segregated institution. The white people go to church together and the black people are in separate churches. I'm sorry, I shouldn't. Yes, yeah. no, yes. no. It's it's true, it's true. It, it just hurts me and I had to say that. Yeah, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I think this would be a community discussion. Not, like, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have all the answers. Um, but yes, and, and so, you know, I, like something 
and I don't necessarily know what the answer is, but I do know that something has to happen. We need to do something to gather these churches together and to, to not only bring us together in some real forum or um, movement or something, but really to, um, to relax the reins of the church so that the, 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 when we're not just talking about, we understand that the spiritual life of our people also involves their political and cultural lives, their social lives, that you can't feed the spirit without um, ensuring that people are le living in some like equitable way. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, the church absolutely, one of the, um, in, in something that I, I was reading, write, writing, I gave an example about um, how um, it was in the church that Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Uh, King, really became propelled, uh, you know, his status um, in the civil rights movement because it was that, that church um, and the, the white mob surrounded them and they were doing a, a civil rights meeting. And, and those meetings were happening in churches, right? right? Like the church was the space. And now you got people don't even want to touch um, the topics. You know, they just want to stick to the Bible and not touch what's happening um, around us. Yes. And so, and, but it was in, in, uh, in the, the church that, the, um, that, you know, these movements were, were really created. And, um, and so it's so important for us to, uh, to, to, to get back our church. And I don't know whether it's, um, you know, as members that we need to uh, come together and um, maybe ask more of the church talk about it more, again, have that same courage that I talked about administrators need to have with the higher administration on the college. Maybe we need to have that um, with the leadership of our churches, that as members, we feel the agency to be able to come to them and say, we need more from the church. We expect more. We want more. Um, we need to do more. We need to engage with um, a, you know, a, another church. I'm sure folks in here, whether y'all work together, or our friends that might uh, attend different churches, uh, you have the ability to to uh, to be able to with e e whether it's bring together you know four churches. Sometimes it doesn't have to start with all the churches in Monterey and together. Can four churches get together uh, based on four members coming to each church and saying, I I'd like to to um, to develop this um, program where on a Saturday all four of our churches kind of get together and do a, um, a, a family meeting. Um, I grew up in, like I said, South Carolina. My family uh, grew up going to um, these camp grounds, these, uh, these church camps and, uh, you know, revival camps and everything. And, and it was really a, a space where people came from all over South Carolina um, to, you know, to gather together and, you know, live for a week or whatever and, and uh, talk and discuss and, and, uh, and, and everything. We need to, to, to do that a little bit more. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, I think it, it's uh, the, the answer lies in, in all of us and in, in what we're willing to do and how are we willing to speak up in our own spaces. One more question. And can you hear me? Ish. Um, <laughs> and one of the things we talk about is how the kids can sort of get this out into the open and get this out into a public space. And one of the things I worry about is constantly saying Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, can you talk about how maybe social media, if implemented differently or if just put into different hands, could maybe be a vehicle for social change? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, <laughs> It, it, it absolutely is. I mean, um, like first, I, I um, you know, I think what you're doing is really, really important. Yeah, um, because again, that's a, a, a what I like about the use of spoken words word in the arts is that it's a, a freeing space where there are no like parameters around how you need to speak or how you need to sound or what you need to say or what you need to do. That it's a, a space where uh, young people's voices can just fully. Uh, be heard, and um, and it, I also think that it, there's a, a, a responsibility that comes with it uh, because like when when someone gives you the microphone, and I don't care whether it's one person or a million people or whatever, if anyone is willing to listen to you, 
you have a responsibility to think about what you're, you're saying, you know? And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that, that work is really, really important. And so I, I thank you for working with, with the, those young people. But um, an example that I'll give about social media um, that I often share with my classes, at, when I was at George Mason, um, and we had an incident happen on our campus where um, it was the library and you know students have uh, study rooms in the library and you kind of check out a study room whatever so finals time and you know the tensions are high during finals time so they um this young man um and he he was an international student uh from africa uh and i forget what country he was from but he was an african student and he um he checked out the study room and set up all his stuff uh, right, so I guess he was, you know, set up for a couple hours, and um, he realized that he uh, left a book in his his room, and his room, his residence hall was right next to the library, so he knew he could just run uh, back to his room uh, and get back there um, really fast. It wasn't going to be like, you know, it's going to take him an hour to get back or anything like that. So he ran to his room, came back, maybe took him 10 minutes, and uh, a young uh, white woman had uh, taken his his room, um, and she took all his stuff and she set it outside of the room. So you know, he he you know says to her, "Look, I had this room; it's checked out. Um, you, you saw my all my things spread out, all my books and notebooks and everything were in here. Why would you take all my stuff?" And so that, she was like, "Well, it was empty when I came in; like no one was here, and so you know, you left your stuff, and um, and and so now I I have it." And she refused to move. So. They um, get into this uh, back and forth, you know, arguing, and they both refuse to move. So he's like, well, I'm not leaving because I have this room checked out. And she's not leaving because, you know, she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to give up the room. There are no more rooms. So she calls the police, the campus police. And so when the police come, they separate them, and uh, first they go and talk to her. Okay. And so they, they have their conversation with her. Then they come over to him. And, um, and they tell him that he needs to get his things and, um, and leave the library. Not just give her the room or go to another room. He needed to completely leave the library. So he's really upset. And he's like, you know, wait a minute. Y'all didn't even come over and ask me my side of the story. Like, y'all just talked to her, and now you're making me leave? And, you know, and he's like really emotional crying and everything. So they're like, look, if you're going to resist, then that's a whole other thing. So you need to leave. So he has to pack up his stuff and he leaves. He goes straight to the, uh, the campus police station and he files a complaint. So then he goes to his residence hall and he, he goes to the study room at the end of his hall. Um, so he sets back up in there. And uh, then the police come into the study hall room in his residence hall looking for him. And, uh, and so they're, they're like, uh, you know, he said, well, what, is this about the complaint? Do y'all need more information? They're like, no, we're here to arrest you. Um, we're arresting you for kidnapping. What? Yes. So um, the, that uh, he basically, you know, held, the girl was saying that, that, that he was holding her in there and he wouldn't allow her to leave. So, you right, now kidnapping is a, like a federal offense. Yeah. Right, so this is real. And so they, they, um, they take him uh, to jail. Now, this is an international student. His parents are thousands of miles away. And, um, but he happened to be an RA. He was a, a student leader on campus. And one of the other RAs, another young white woman, um, she, they, she heard about what happened to him. And she created a Facebook page. And she posted the entire scenario on Facebook. And, um, and then like shared it with a, a bunch of people. And then they shared it with a bunch of people. And um, then Washington Post, somebody on Washington Post saw it. Then CNN saw it. Right, and so then it starts picking up all this, this traction. And uh, and it's it's getting on. So it's 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 on like the the internet sites of all these major news networks, and so um, and the Facebook page starts to get like thousands of likes, and like it's almost like a little petition. So then, of course, then George Mason is like, oh man, wait. <laughs> 
So they get involved. So the university um, go make sure that the, the charges are dropped. And, um, and then they um, start this thing with their, the police department, um, a, like a, a, a racial training, sensitivity training, whatever. Um, and uh, you know, so, so all of this happens simply because this young girl used Facebook as a, a, a form of, um, of activism. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that um, it, what, I th what, what I often say about um, social media is that it's taken, it's allowed the average person to have a huge voice. Uh, because where, whereas before you would have to pay thousands of dollars for advertising and, and stuff like that in a newspaper or um, at, on a network, like no one could really even think about, you know, taking out an ad on, on CBS or ABC or whatever. But now you can reach thousands of people um, and not have to pay, you know, anything. You can go to the library and, and, and use the internet or whatever, but it's giving voice uh, to the, the average person if it's used in, in the right way. Thank you, Toby. That was extraordinary. Um, I've, I'm blown away. <laughs> uh, I know it's, it's 7.30. I hope you don't have to fly out of here uh, the second we have good save William you are the man <laughs> uh, we have copies of Toby's extraordinary book my culture my color myself and um, we're going to bring those down right now I know you probably want to say hi to Toby and perhaps engage her a little more we're not going to have you go out there in that creepy little hall we're going to bring your books down here uh, you can pick one up we have wine we have snacks um, the, uh, the reception was very graciously uh, sponsored by MPC, so there is no cost. But if you'd like to make a donation, that would be great. Uh, the YWCA just purchased, relocate, just relocated and purchased our domestic violence shelter for uh, women and children and soon to be pets, because pets are vulnerable too. So if you'd like to make a donation, you know how it is when you buy a house, you need all kinds of stuff. So that would be great. Um, thank you. Come again for the, the final installment of our Racial Justice Speaker Series. On Thursday, October 8th, Dr. Jessica Vasquez from the University of Oregon is going to be joining us to talk about her experiences as a scholar um, in um, describing the experiences of first and second generation Mexican Americans and their challenges and opportunities in the acculturation experience. So until then, See you later, have a great night, and thank you very much for coming out.